to to uh, respect people's time, particularly those that came on early. My name is Jenny Myrick. Oh, look, somebody put that picture up with me. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing the same necklace. That's incredible. So we are um, a nonprofit that's been around for mm, about seven years. We're called Cathedral District Jacks Inc. We have a board of 18 people that oversee the work that we're doing. And um, <clears throat> this is our first webinar. So excuse any bloopers that we run on to today. Um, we are redeveloping 36 blocks of Northeast Quadrant of Downtown. It's about 118 acres. And of those 118 acres, 50% of them are surface parking lots. Now, at first blush, you'd say, oh, that's terrible. We think it's great because you can assemble those lots and put homes on them. So our goal is to redevelop the neighborhood with at least 2,500 new residential units. They can be apartments or they can be owner occupied. Right now, they're mostly apartments. So in the short period of time that we've been around, we have 600 apartments either under construction right now or in financing and $42 million worth of capital investment in the neighborhood. So we're on a roll and we wanna make sure we keep on a roll. We get a questions all the time from developers and from people who live and work downtown about the homeless scenario. So we thought we would try to put um, a thought leader out there for us to listen to today to answer some of these questions. Just a couple of housekeeping tips before we start. You can use your chat box to, uh, which is at the bottom on your screen, mm -hmm. um, to ask questions. And we will try to assemble questions that are similar so that we can answer them uh, during the show. At the, well, as you say, at the end of the show. And then if we can't get to you, we'll try to get to you with an answer soon after that by email. So let me now introduce um, uh, Cindy Funkhauser, uh, who is the president and CEO of the Salzbacher Center. Cindy and I go back a long ways. Um, I consider her to be a thought leader in this topic of homelessness in the whole state of Florida. Um, she is the head of the largest homeless resource provider in North Florida. She's been there as the CEO for 13 years, but she's been on and off at Salzbacher in different capacities for many years. Prior to Salzbacher, Cindy was the executive director of the Beaches Emergency Assistance Ministry. She has, uh, uh, has her master's in social work from FSU and an undergraduate degree in psychology from George Mason University. Prior to that, prior to Salzbacher, she was for 20 years with a Fortune 500 company um, doing sales and marketing. So she knows both sides of the aisle. She knows about social work and she knows about the sales and marketing aspects of it. She has served on so many boards and so many awards that I only picked out just a couple to share with you. Um, she's been on the United Way board. She is on the UNF Brooks College of Health's Dean Council. She's an honorary life member of the Florida PTA. And in 2014, the Jacksonville Business Journal declared her the ultimate CEO. And um, the, she's received an Eve Award from the Times Union. And in 2023, just recently, Cindy was awarded the Humanitarian Award by One Jacks, which is a very distinguished honor. So our, uh, our presentation today will be taped. So if you know somebody who would like to watch it later, um, uh, we'll be putting that up on our website. You can pick it up there. Um, so... Um, my friend, Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can start the program. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Now, I am not the best at screen sharing, which I told Jenny and Alex earlier. So bear with me a second. Here we go. Let me know if you, if you see this. Looking good. Looking good. Okay. Eureka. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you all for being on the Zoom tonight, this very stormy, icky evening. I appreciate it. I really appreciate, Jenny, that it isn't in person since it's storming and <laughs> icky. I'm sure we're all happy to be, you know, mm -hmm. in our nice, warm uh, offices or home environments. So um, <clears throat> I want to say um, 
to Jenny, which she already knows this, but uh, Jenny is probably one of the most courageous, brave people I've ever <laughs> in my life. Because 28 years ago, when I am Soulsbacker, when the city of Jacksonville and the United Way and I am Soulsbacker and Jenny Myrick and Hugh Jones uh, knew that we needed to do something different around homelessness, even all those many years ago, 28 years ago, that we needed to actually resolve people's homelessness, not just sweep them off into a corner or give them a bed and a meal and then send them on their way, that doesn't solve homelessness. And so <clears throat> the idea of the Soulsbacker, um, uh, I guess, evolved with these different cross-sector groups. And Jenny was on city council at the time. I believe, were you the president of city council then? or No. No, you were just, but you're on city council. And downtown was her district. And so they looked at dozens and dozens of sites. And of course, nobody wanted Soulsbacker Center in their backyard at all. And so Jenny stuck her neck out, her neck out and um, was able to cite the Soulsbacker where we are now across from the jail. And that was very courageous. And I know Jenny <clears throat> at the time received a lot, a lot, a lot of pushback for that. So I always want to say Soulsbacker would have never uh, been able to exist if it weren't for you, Jenny. So I always want to thank you for that because we really appreciate it. And a lot of great work has been done through the years at Soulsbacker and thank you for that. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. say that to my friend, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So tonight, what I want to talk about is what is Soulsbacker's plan moving forward? Um, but also, first of all, Downtown homelessness. I want to give an update on where we are as a city and how we compare to other cities across the country. So I think um, people, you know, they see homeless people downtown. They think, you know, that we, and we do, we're having more homeless people, but that's the case across the country. But I think you'll see when you look at the numbers that I'm going to share with you. We, Jacksonville, is considered a national model. So I've already uh, talked about this a little bit that we were founded by the city of Jacksonville, the United Way of Northeast Florida, and then a group of area philanthropists and business people, including Jenny. Um, the name, the inspiration was I am Soulsbacker, who also uh, was on city council. At the time, we opened in 1995 and offered basic services to homeless men only, but today we're home to over 400 men, women, and children. So I want to talk a little bit about a snapshot. So right before COVID hit, or right around the same time, uh, the United Way, Jesse Ball DuPont, and the Community Foundation paid for a, a uh, re research project into Jacksonville. How is Jacksonville looking? What is our approach to homelessness? How does it compare to others in the country? And how are we doing? So Barb Poppy and Associates is a nationally renowned, ex they're experts on homelessness. They work with cities across the country. So the, the following two slides are some information out of the report which was actually published right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was in um, June of 2020, but it was a, it took about a year to do this research project. And so what are the causes of homelessness, just generally speaking? I think these things are pretty self-evident, but housing is out of reach. So supply and affordability, and I cannot stress strongly enough that we are in a housing crisis, an affordable housing crisis in this country, and particularly in Jacksonville, because we are an extremely hot market here. We have all sorts of folks coming in from other cities and other states. They know what a great <laughs> bargain Jacksonville is, a beautiful quality of life here. 
So folks are coming in and they are buying up the land right and left and, you know, buying up um, anything that was affordable before. So the supply of highly affordable housing is really uh, at a crisis level for us. In the past, I think three years, and this is in the daily record article that's on the front page today, I hope you'll look at it. Jacksonville is number five in the nation for highest rental increases in the last five years. Number five, it was 22%. Number five in the nation. So that is the number one cause of homelessness, the lack of affordable housing. Health issues, chronic and crisis, and that's you know physical health issues, but no surprise to anyone on the call, also behavioral health issues. There's a lot of mental illness in the homeless population and in the population at large. Um, after COVID, mental health, the, the uh, occurrence of mental health has really taken quite a large um, hike. Many, many more people are depressed. That's no surprise to anyone either. So we do have also, you know, we do have a quite a challenge around mental health. In, inadequate income, chronic or crisis, basically people's, you know, paychecks are not keeping up with the cost of living. You know, we, we do have quite high inflation right now. So again, no surprise. Domestic violence and trauma, recent and lifetime. So uh, research will tell you that the majority of people that are li living literally on the street have experienced trauma in their lives. As a matter of fact, um, a female that's been on the street for any length of time there's a 100% chance that she's been sexually assaulted. So people on the street are more often, way more often the victim of crime than they are the perpetrator of crime. But this is the chart that really tells the story. So this compares Jacksonville to the nation. And this is over a 10 year period from um, 2009 to 2019. So you can see that we outperform the national average in reducing homelessness in all but one category. And we outperformed uh, by a lot, not by a little. And why is this? It's because the providers here in Jacksonville work very closely together. And over the last seven or eight years, uh, Mayor Curry has had a downtown homeless task force where he got all the right people and the stakeholders to the table, not just the homeless providers, but also JSO, the hospitals, uh, JTA, the education system, downtown vision, so on and so forth. So we've all been working very hard together in a cross-sector way to really focus on and reduce homelessness, particularly number one was homeless veterans. We laser focused on homeless veterans in Jacksonville. We decreased homeless veterans in that decade by 82%. That's huge, 82% versus 49% across the country. Families, Jacksonville reduced, reduced homelessness in that decade by 46%, national average was 28%. Chronically homeless, what does that mean? Chronic homelessness means a person that's been on the street for a year or longer. These are the folks you are thinking of. Um, you've seen them around, they've been on the street. A lot of them have um, severe mental illness. We decreased that by 60% in that decade. Nationally, they only decreased it by 10%. Now, the next one is the area of some concern, uh, and I think you will all appreciate this, unsheltered, which means newly homeless that are on the street. Newly homeless people that are on the street, they haven't been on the street for a year or longer, they're newly homeless. We un unfortunately underperformed the national average our unsheltered population went up during that decade by 
And across the nation, that number went down by 7%. That's the number that we obviously need to understand and work on and figure out, you know, what are all the barriers and challenges? I think we just talked about some of them of why more and more people are becoming homeless and they're on the street as opposed to going into um, shelter or other programs. But in the total homeless um, numbers, we reduced total homelessness during that decade by 32% and nationally it was reduced by 10%. So these are numbers that we're really proud of. Barb Poppy, who did this report, really um, sung our praises to the city and to um, the folks that were gathered when she reported this out. So it may not seem like it to some folks on the call, but we uh, certainly do not have the same homeless problem that other cities have. And we are constantly trying to do better because there should be no one that's homeless on the street. We want to end homelessness in Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, that's our goal. Um, and, you know, we've done a pretty good job uh, at this point in time uh, to get where we are today. So those are the numbers. Who, who are the folks that are unsheltered? the unsheltered population that we just talked about. 75% of them are male, 56% are African-American, 10% are unaccompanied youth, 18 to 24. A lot of that is kids aging out of foster care and also LGBTQ kids that have um, been, um, you know, kind of booted out of their own house. And then veterans, which is still 6%. Six, 6 so that's who the unsheltered population is comprised of. So a lot of you might know that there has been a um, special committee on the quality of life issues at the city at the end of last year. The um, president, Terrence Freeman, this was his initiative, and there were three groups that worked in the quality of life issues, and it was a homelessness task force, an affordable housing task force, and an access to health care task force. So these were the three findings that came out of the homeless task force. There are approximately 3,400 individuals currently on the by name list. They're homeless and seeking housing assistance. 3,400 individuals though, that makes up families, that makes up single men, single women, youth, veterans, that makes up everyone. And that's people, um, some of them are couch surfing. A lot of times with families they are, they might be in hotels. So that's not the number of street homeless. That's the number of total people that come into our system fill out applications and say, we need housing assistance. So that's who we have the names of. Um, the system of care does not have enough resources to address the individuals and families currently experiencing homelessness. And the inflow of individuals into the system of care continues to increase as funding levels are decreasing. And I might add, as housing inventory is also decreasing. So now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about us, about Soulsbacker. And, you know, what services we're currently offering and what we're planning to do in the next few years. So what you see here is our downtown campus, what most people think of when they think of Soulsbacker. This is the site that Jenny found for us <laughs> across, across the street from the jail. And at this campus, this is now considered, this is called our men's campus. And you'll hear about this in a minute, but the women and families are no longer there. They haven't been there for five years. And we'll talk about where they moved. But this is the downtown campus. We have the urban rest stop, the day resource center there, which we're gonna talk some more about. 
We do have 80 emergency housing beds there. Um, we used to have 360 emergency housing beds in that building, and we now have 80, and we'll talk about that. We have a medical respite facility there. So we work with the hospital, and they pay us, and they can discharge homeless patients to our medical respite facility that need follow-up care, particularly um, the biggest hospital we work with is UF Health. Uh, we have a veterans dorm there. So we have 10 units for male veterans. And then upstairs at that facility, what used to be where the women and families are, we now have rentals. So the men that are working, we do um, offer single room occupancy. So they have their own private uh, rooms, but they do pay for those because they're working. And, you know, we want to make sure that they're, used to paying rent when they move out so that they have established that that's voluntary if you want to if you want to move into those rooms also um and probably maybe most importantly we have a huge health clinic there we are a federally qualified health center when people think of soulsbacker they do not think of health care but about 60 percent of everything we do now is health care so we are the largest federal clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. We provide lunch and dinner to the community 365 days per year for the last 28 years. We have never been closed one single day, not even during the hurricanes when we evacuated to the Red Cross shelter <laughs> because we even provided meals there. So I always say, we always say, hunger doesn't take a holiday and hunger doesn't take a weekend. So we do provide meals um, 365. And last year alone, we provided 414,000 meals to the community. We don't charge for the meals. And we also don't charge for the men that are living in the 80 emergency units. We don't charge for that. Um, I want to just give you a couple of other numbers while we're on this particular slide, and it is the most important number when you're looking at the outcomes of Sulzbecker, because our number one goal is to end someone's homelessness. So last fiscal year alone, we put 487 people, even in the housing crisis, we were able to find permanent housing for 487 formerly homeless people. They're now housed um, because we were able to find them housing. That's the most important number I can give you because we ended their homelessness and that's the goal. We also, um, in addition to the meals, we provided 23,000 clinic visits through our clinics to over 7,000 patients. So those are, you know, those are big numbers and numbers that we're really uh, proud of. Housing, healthcare, hope is our tagline. The hope piece, by the way, is a very important piece because that's income. It's education, it's job training, and it's job placement. So last year, even during hard times, uh, we put 417 people into jobs. We're putting about 30 people a month out of the urban rest stop alone. These are people that are on the street. They don't even have a place to stay at night. We, we put about 30 of them a month into jobs. So, you know, that is a huge focus of ours is to get people income. This is the urban rest stop. There's the line uh, at lunch. And the urban rest stop, by the way, in our campus, the urban rest stop came out of the mayor's downtown homelessness task force because folks like you on the line were saying, why are people wandering around downtown? Why are they in what was then Hemming Park? Why are they hanging out in James Weldon Park? Why are they hanging out in the library? Um, the other shelters, the model of most shelters at that time was that you come in up, you line up at four o'clock, 
you may or may not get a bed, but if you do, you're out right after breakfast. You don't stay there during the day. That is not Sulzbacher's model. It never has been. That's why Jenny and the folks that were, you know, instrumental in getting our campus started, they recognized people need a place to be during the day where they can work on their homelessness. So everybody that lives with us, you don't come back every night and get a bed. You get a bed, that, that's your bed, and you're gonna work with a case manager and you're gonna work on housing, you're gonna work on healthcare, and you're gonna work on income. Those are the three things. So on our campus, people have never been forced to leave, but now we've opened up the campus even further with the urban rest stop. People that don't live with us can come there, street homeless during the day, we probably get about 150 street homeless people during the day that come and, you know, they have access to all the services that we provide, but they also have just a place to be where they can take showers, they can use the restroom, they can use the laundry, they get their mail, we connect them into the system, they can go to our Goodwill Job Junction that's on site, as I said, they can get a job, they can see a behavioral therapist, they can see a doctor, um, all of those things are on our campus. And so folks can come during the day, get meals, and just have a place that know, they know they are welcome. And, and that's been so beneficial for them and I think for downtown. So if it weren't for the urban rest stop, there would be at least another 150 people during the day wandering around uh, downtown. I wanna talk for a minute about the COVID impact on the homeless population and how our community, the, the um, shelters and the mayor's homelessness task force joined forces during COVID. It was uh, a challenge for everybody, let's be honest. But if you're running shelters, think about that. You have a hundred people or more in very close quarters, how are you gonna control a pandemic from sweeping through your facility? And then, you know, how are you gonna prevent people that are homeless and may get exposed from wandering around and exposing everybody else? So in March of 2020, you, you will all remember when the mayor, you know, we had the shutdown, March of 2020, and, Downtown became a ghost town, literally a ghost town. We of course came in every day, but there weren't a lot of other people downtown, but us and, and homeless folks. It was scary, uh, it was creepy. And so um, homeless people actually started dispersing. But what we needed to do as the homeless providers <clears throat> is make sure that we got together we developed protocols, we developed uh, ways to assess people, keep other people safe, test people, isolate anybody that was positive. And so this group, this task force, which was a subcommittee of the Mayor's Downtown Homelessness Task Force, met weekly for two years. We met weekly for two years. And we were able, in May of 2020, Quest Diagnostics, I, you all probably know of them, they came to us to Jacksonville, Florida uh, because national experts sent them to us because we have such a good you know, homeless system here. And they said, we want to partner with a city and we wanna try to test every homeless person in that city. Now this was May of 2020. And so of course, we're the federal clinic and we were receiving, you know, um, testing, test kits and all that sort of thing from the federal government. We had huge Health and Hope on Wheels mobile that we had just launched in February of 2020. So we started partnering. We partnered with all the other shelters and we were going to all the other shelters. But for one week in May, Quest Diagnostics partnered with us. We pulled in UF Health. And um, they helped us. We tested 700 homeless people in a week in Jacksonville, Florida. And of that 700 homeless people, homeless persons, there were zero positives. That 
was so astounding to me that I went back to Quest and I said, I think you need to rerun these numbers because that's impossible. How could we not even have one? They reran the numbers and at that time, zero. And I will tell you throughout COVID, we were able to really minimize the spread of COVID among the homeless population in Jacksonville by doing a couple of things. There was a lot of funding coming down from the federal government. We set up hotels uh, to put people in A that were positive. If we had a person test positive, we sent them by ambulance to hotels that we had partnered with. Now remember, nobody was staying in hotels, so we, there, you know, it was safe. And so we would send the person to the hotel, they would socially isolate, we would bring the meals to their rooms, we had staff on site. We put over 500 people during COVID into hotels to socially isolate and or most of them were just really medically vulnerable. And so we put them in hotels to protect them. So we uh, were able to get 500 homeless people off the street during COVID and also um, a lot of those folks into housing. So a majority of those folks were able to actually get into permanent housing. That's what you can do when you actually have the funding that you need. So it was miraculous. Um, also a national model. And Dawn Gilman from Changing Homelessness was on a national um, panel that talked about that. So we received a lot of um, recognition nationally for our whole uh, way that, that we approached COVID in the, in the community. And it was really a cross-sector uh, collaboration. And I want to uh, remind you, those of you that maybe were downtown and you remember the encampment, the encampment that happened a couple of years ago over on, I can never remember State and Union, uh, whichever one, State and Jefferson. <clears throat> Jefferson. Yeah, Jefferson and State though, wasn't it? Anyway. Right. There was a huge uh, encampment, about 100 people or so that formed there, and a lot of um, not good stuff was happening. And so this task force, the mayor's task force, we partnered really closely with JSO and the city on this and all the homeless providers. And I want to really give a shout out to Alex Safakis, who gave us a large building, a warehouse downtown, we were able to stand up an emergency bridge shelter within two weeks, get all of those folks out of that encampment. All of the homeless providers manned that um, bridge shelter and worked on getting those folks into housing and out of that encampment. So we were able to shut down that encampment by all working together, us, JSO, JTA, some of the folks that were really vulnerable, medically vulnerable, we did put in a hotel, but the bulk of those folks um, went to the bridge shelter. And so just a lot of really, really important good work happened during COVID. And it really was a partnership of everybody in Jacksonville, the hospitals, the city, JSO, Downtown Vision, ambassadors, the lots and lots of different folks at the table. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because uh, the community at large has no idea that that, <laughs> probably most of that even transpired because um, you were working at home. So, but there was a lot of stuff going on downtown. We also on our campus <clears throat> for about a year and a half, we tested every single person, every single day that came onto our campus, hundreds of people, so that we could capture anybody that tested positive. And if they did test positive, we isolated them, we sent them to the hotel because we didn't want homeless people inadvertently wandering around and you know spreading COVID to the community at large. So a lot of work went on. Um, around that. And I really just wanted to talk about that because we're very proud of that. We should be proud of that as a city. And I was telling Jenny earlier that I was actually asked to be on a 
Apple podcast about that whole testing thing that we did because we were the first city in the country that was able to accomplish that. So um, those were some very trying times, <laughs> trying, trying times. Um, now, outreach. So outreach is extremely, extremely important in this conversation. You know, I know that a lot of you see mentally ill people on the street and, you know, folks that have been out there for a while and they need, they need help. And so what we've done for probably 20 years, the two vehicles that say Hope Team, those vehicles have been on the street for almost 20 years. The one downtown has been on the street for 20 years and the one at the beach has been on the street probably 15 years. So we have a social service person and medical and a medical staff, either a psychiatrist or a doctor or a nurse practitioner that ride these two vans. They're out every single day on the street, checking on the folks that um, you're talking about or that you see, the street homeless. And <clears throat> so we've been doing that for a long time. But right before COVID, and again, this was as a result of the mayor's downtown homelessness task force, we were able to get funding to start these two huge blue buses that you see, the Health and Hope on Wheels Mobile, which we cut the ribbon on in February of 2020. That was heavily utilized during COVID and is still being utilized to go all around Duval County to meet people where they are, find them on the street, get them connected up to healthcare and behavioral health services. Now, the one at the bottom, we just cut the ribbon on two months ago, and it's called Housing and Hope on Wheels. That bus has a housing navigator and a SOAR processor that were funded by United Way. They help connect people to housing and to mainstream benefits. So about 30% of the people, maybe even 40, of the people that you see on the street, living on the street, do would and do qualify for disability because either physically they're disabled or from a behavioral health perspective and maybe both. So we're trying to make sure that we have people in the community, on the street, meeting people where they are, to get them connected up to housing and to income. Housing, healthcare, hope. That's, that's what we focus on. And so that is on the street now. We're actually partnering um, in all parts of Jacksonville, but Joyce Morgan uh, well, you know, uh, contacted us, I don't know, eight months ago, because remember I said homeless people were dispersing? So homeless people have been dispersing a lot uh, to other parts of town. So <clears throat> there's a problem in Arlington. There's a problem on the west side. There's a problem on the north side. There's a problem at the beach. Not a very big, a small problem at the beach. So we are taking these mobile units out to where people are because you can't build brick and mortar everywhere. And honestly, nobody wants us in their community. So this mobile fleet is very, very, very important moving forward. As we move out of downtown completely, we're gonna be utilizing this mobile fleet to still provide services in the core without having a brick and mortar to take people, the services they need and the shuttle bus at the top, which is this one, JTA provided, get people where they need to be. So we'll be bringing people from downtown out to our new campus. And also uh, right now this goes all around the core and it brings people from other shelters to the urban rest stop, also takes them to get uh, to where they need to get their ID and other services like that. This bus down here is gonna have DCF rotating through and also the VA rotating through and other uh, other providers are going to rotate through. So this is really important, this model moving forward, because there are people, a lot of people, who will not go into shelter because of behavioral health issues, mostly. And so we want to make sure that we can find them on the street, 
reach them on the street, give them the medication that they need, get them income and get them off the street. So that's what this fleet um, does. So our relocation, Soulsbackers relocation from downtown, there's really three main reasons for it. Flooding on our campus is increasing. So if you've ever <laughs> been around the Maxwell House and Soulsbacker campuses when it rains, uh, you're gonna see flooding, even if it's not a major rain. But during hurricanes, the last three times, Sulzbacher was under four feet of water. Uh, we had to evacuate our shelter to the Red Cross shelter. We're at the lowest point of downtown. And so uh, that doesn't make sense for us <clears throat> from a sustainability perspective. Also, we're in the middle of the new downtown entertainment district. The jail will be moving. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's a lot of people pushing for that. And so we were proactive after we opened the first village five years ago. I immediately went to the city and Sam Musa was there, still there then. And I said, look, you know, we're on city property. We have a 35 year lease. We're coming up on 30 years. We want to move. We want to move. We need to move. We understand that. We don't need to be in the core anymore. And, you know, our goal is to build housing. So how can you help us do that? Because <clears throat> the first time around, we did not ask the city for any money, which we'll see in a minute, that was private investment. So um, the city, of course, is 150% <laughs> behind it. And then lastly, the need for affordable housing. Affordable housing ends homelessness. And that's, that's that. So here was the two-step process. In 2018, we opened the Soulsbacker Village for women and families. We moved 200 homeless women and families with children out of downtown. So the 340 that used to be in that shelter building, we moved 200 out of, out of there in 2018. And then step two is the Enterprise Village. We want to remove the remaining about 100 homeless sheltered men out of downtown and into a permanent housing campus. That's our goal. We wanna be out of downtown. So this is what, um, for those of you that may not be familiar with the Soulsbecker Village, this is it. It's beautiful. It's, <clears throat> it's about uh, 90,000 square feet. We were able to do this through a partnership, the partnerships you see here, Florida Housing Finance Corporation, low income tax credits, Hunt Capital Partners, who is our private investment um, organization, a state budget line item of a million dollars. And then we raised $8 million privately through a capital campaign. Our partners, our Vest Corps uh, was the developer and Summit was the builder or is the builder. This is what the apartments look like at the Soulsbacker Village. They're fully furnished. They come as you see them because when a homeless person moves into an apartment, they only have the clothes on their back. So you have to think about everything that they need. And we don't like to put people into an apartment with a mattress on the floor. We wanna make sure that they have dignified and respectful housing. And so we partnered with um, IKEA who had just come into town at the time. And we had a private donor that donated about a half a million dollars to us. We furnished every single apartment and temporary unit, over a thousand pieces of furniture. <laughs> now, what do you know about Ikea? A thousand <laughs> pieces of furniture, think about that. What? Yeah. Um, we had over 500 volunteers come in over the course of three weeks to put together a thousand pieces of furniture. And it was every everybody from little old church ladies to the Jacksonville Jaguars, to the Navy, to first responders, to the Jacksonville Chamber, uh, high school football team, anybody we could get our hands on. Businesses, everybody came in there and put together furniture. And that's a remarkable story in and of itself. Five, 500 volunteers in three weeks. We're really, really grateful to the community. Um, we have a huge pediatric clinic. So remember, 
this campus is for women and families. So we had to consider what do homeless families need? 90% of our homeless families are single mothers. And so, you know, what do single mothers need? They need a pediatric health center. So we have a huge one there. We're in partnership with uh, Wolfson and UF Health, primary care, dental, vision, behavioral health. This is the waiting room. There's six dental operatories. It's all state of the art. It's a beautiful um, facility. <clears throat> we also have um, the Crawford Early Learning Center. So we have, what do moms need? They need daycare. So we have an early learning center there. We have Goodwill on site. We've always had Goodwill on our campus. So Goodwill is also there. That job training and job placement piece is one of the most important and critical things that we do. Not to toot our own horn, but we are an award-winning agency. This is me <laughs> with my friend, John Rutherford in DC. And this is our investor to the left. We won the Charles, Charles L. Edson Tax Credit Excellence Award with our first ever uh, affordable housing complex that we ever built. We won that national award, which we're very, very proud of. Those are some of the other awards that the Sulzbacher Village has won. Also, I wanted to mention the last two HUD secretaries, Secretary Fudge visited us last summer, Secretary Carson visited us in 2019. And in both instances, they said that the Sulzbacher Village was one of the most innovative um, housing developments that they had seen across the nation. So that's in Jacksonville, Florida. It's a national model. We should all feel proud of that. So the second village, step two of Soulsbacker moving out of downtown, there will be housing, there will be health care, and there will be hope. So uh, short-term and permanent uh, workforce housing, there'll be all of the clinics that we currently offer and more. Um, and then the center piece of this whole thing, thing that makes it an enterprise is actually a for-profit manufacturing plant on our campus. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but we're also gonna have a huge training facility there in cooperation and partnership with FSCJ and Goodwill. Housing, healthcare, hope. So what's relocating? What are we keeping near downtown? And what are their proposed new services? You can see here, um, we're relocating the things on the left, the things that we currently do. The community meals and the urban rest stop are being reimagined. We um, are looking to do something not in the core, but with another provider a little outside the core, those talks are underway. Our goal is to get the services out of the core. We're trying to get the services out of the core. That's my goal. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. Then the new services will be the 100 units of permanent housing, the manufacturing facility, additional health services, a potential restaurant and cafe, and a pharmacy. This is the Soulsbacker Enterprise Village. The piece to the back, this is 100 apartments, studio and one bedrooms for men. The piece right here, this is um, the health service piece. And when you see the site plan, you'll see everything's not jammed up like this. <laughs> we bought 17 acres at Golf Air and 95 back in November. So this will all be spread out. Uh, over the 17 acres, but this is all of our healthcare here. This is um, is our headquarters. So it's, you know, HR and finance and all of our administrative um, services, as well as it will be 80 transitional units. So 100 permanent units, 100 apartments, 80 transitional units. We don't have anything called shelter. Um, we do not want to have anything called shelter. The people can come off the street still and they can go into a transitional unit, which is a single, it's like a, 
tiny mini hotel room that's got a kitchenette and a bathroom. And that's where people will move from the street directly into that. Also, that's going to make people more willing to come into non-shelter shelter because they have an individual place. They don't feel, um, especially people with behavioral health, they'll feel safe and secure and you know not overly stimulated. So there'll be 80 units. So that's 180 people right there that we're going to be moving out of the core immediately. <clears throat> Then this here in the bottom left is the job training. That's Goodwill and FSCJ. And this is just a piece of the manufacturing facility. This is the site plan as it exists now. It's a new site plan that we just got from our architect. So these are now the 100 units are here across from the manufacturing plant because this is workforce housing. We're hoping that a lot of these 100 people are going to be working in this plant. Over here is the admin building and the 80 temporary units. This is our clinical medical clinics. This is um, <clears throat> future is going to be an ALF for people with mental health, a mental health ALF. We're also going to be adding substance abuse residential beds here because we do not have enough of that in Jacksonville. That's a huge gap, especially for our population. And this large pink building is the job training and manufacturing facility. So <clears throat> how can this become a reality? So these will be the partners for, for this deal or for this campus. We're gonna be using 4% uh, bond tax credit. So the Jacksonville Housing Finance Authority has already um, provided us with the initial approval to uh, go into underwriting for $16 million of tax credits. We're also gonna be using uh, new market tax credits, which are tax credits that are associated with job creation. We're gonna have capital investors well, we already have a federal uh, budget line item of $2 million that Congressman Rutherford was able to acquire for us this past budget. That goes into healthcare, building the, the health clinic that you saw. The city, I went to them, remember, and I said, we need you to step up this time. And they stepped up um, in a big way. They have provided a HUD ARP um, grant to us. It's really considered a soft loan, but it's $12 million that's been approved through city council. We got the contract on that already. We're going to be looking at private funding and grants. Vescor again is our developer and Summit will be the builder. So I'm sharing some, you know, numbers with you all. And Jenny and I contemplated if I should be oversharing, <laughs> but I'm going to because it takes a lot of money to do something like this. So housing is phase one. That's the 100 permanent units that will get 100 people, homeless people off the street, ending their homelessness and putting them into apartments. Here's how we're gonna do it. The 4% tax credits I talked about, the home ARP I talked about. Um, <clears throat> this is stuff that goes along with the tax credits. This is the number we are still Looking at as a funding gap of $30 million, we're only short $5 million at this point in time, which is not a lot considering, you know, that's uh, $30 million, most of that we already have. So that 5.6, we've already applied for a CDBG grant through the city, which um, could be $1.2 million, and we've applied through the um, Federal Home Loan Bank for $850,000. If we got both of those, we would be down to about three and a half million, which we plan to do through concessionary lending. So we feel really, really close to breaking ground on phase one. We're hoping potentially by the end of the year, but definitely first quarter of next year that will break ground and that will be the first phase. Now, phase two. This is where we're going to be needing your help and the help of our friends here in the community. This is really 
Souls Backer. This is all of the services I talked about that we provide downtown. It's all the health services. It's industrial kitchen. At the, at the new campus, it'll have a culinary training program. It's substance abuse treatment on site. It's Goodwill Job Junction. All of the services. So that's going to cost about $30 million. This is the funding stack as it stands now. We did receive the, the $2 million, which I um, talked about from our good friend, Congressman Rutherford. We do have in the pipeline an LBR at the state for 1.5 million that's pending, CDBG in the pipeline. Um, we're gonna be doing new markets on this one, new market tax credits. So that would be about 18% of the equity, but that leaves us $20 million. That's gonna be our raise. So we're gonna be launching a capital campaign we're um, in the silent phase of that right now, talking to um, some of our large donor friends, and we'll also look at some concessionary debt. But if you want to know how to help Salzbecker move out of downtown, it's this yellow number right here. So uh, we'll be coming out and talking to lots of folks in the community about that. But there is a huge appetite for this. So downtown developers, people that are particularly around the entertainment district. So we feel like um, there's a lot of folks out there that are gonna wanna help us. And we certainly um, would appreciate any and all, all help because this is a heavy lift that we're trying to do. It's a huge project. There's really nothing like this in the entire nation. And I'm not exaggerating. That piece with the manufacturing plant makes this something that you will not find anywhere else because we've searched and it's not out there, but that piece is the piece that makes this really, really unique. This is the FSCJ job training facility. This is the front, this is where the 80 units will be in all of our headquarters. This is the federally qualified health clinics. We also, um, by the way, partner with Mayo. Mayo will be having a teaching clinic at this location as well. And then phase three, which is the manufacturing plant, the enterprise of the enterprise village. Guess what that builds? <clears throat> it builds affordable housing modules. That's what it builds. And so that um, particular company, we've been in talks with them for two years. They're out of Boise, Idaho, and they have um, several plants all over the country. So this manufacturing business will hire 150 people and train them in the construction trades. You'll see a picture of their um, plant in um, Colorado in a second. And this is gonna be a pipeline, not just are we building affordable housing? But it's a pipeline for producing skilled labor for the construction trade. Okay, so how will that piece be done, which is phase three? If we have to build it, this is what we're looking at. But what we're really hoping for and um, the direction we think we're headed is a developer build leaseback. And so, we have a consultant that's working with some developers right now to see if they'd be willing to do a developer build leaseback. So we're working on, on that piece as well. This is the inside. It's a couple of my board members, Barney Smith here, Chantel Davis. These are the folks at this plant. And you can see the modules being built. Each one of these stations is a different trade. So, you know, you'll be learning to um, put up the framing here and then down the road, down here, you'll be putting up drywall, the electrical. Every station is a separate trade, which is uh, really, it's really cool to see. This is what it looks like, a module. It's 720 square feet of living space. You put them together to build multifamily apartment complexes. 
but you can also use it as quads, as a duplex, as a single family. It's very versatile. It's actually the way of the future for man for um, building housing. I saw it first at a HUD Innovation and Housing Conference in DC a few years ago. That's really how we connected with these folks. And um, so it's exciting. This would be the manufacturing plant. Now, in addition to helping the people that were moving and to building affordable housing, the area where we're moving is 32209. And those of you on the call know that that is our most challenged zip code in all of Jacksonville in the Northwest Quadrant. They need health care. They need jobs and job training. They need housing. So everything that happens on this campus is going to benefit this community. It's going to bring over 250 jobs to that neighborhood. We're going to be hiring both residents um, and people that don't live with us uh, will be able to be job trained and hired. And also everybody there will be using the local businesses. So it's just gonna really pump um, some money into that zip code. That zip code, just really quickly, as I said, the most challenged in Jacksonville, average poverty in Jacksonville is 14.5%. In that area, it's 35%. Unemployment, 12%. Homicides, 56 versus 13 percent of adults with at least a high school degree, you can see it's 15 points lower. Every one of the measures that you look at, there is um, problems in that zip code. And so, you know, our goal is to bring resources there and try to help that area. So we're gonna relocate the things on the left. We're gonna add the things on the right and that's going to help this community. This I just wanted to show you, the economic impact of our health services. This is a, a report done by the Florida Association of Community Health Centers, their annual report, 2021. Sulzbacher creates um, directly or indirectly over $35 million of economic impact to our community. That's just our health services. We create directly and indirectly about 275 jobs. And that's currently, that's where we are now. Again, that's the Enterprise Village. Help us make it a reality. That's some of the folks and some of the organizations that are on our board. We're very grateful. We have about 25 board members and they are leaders in all parts um, of our city. So we're really grateful, grateful for that. And that's it, Jenny, Housing well, Health Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, yeah. I was really lucky um, about a month ago to hear this presentation by Cindy. I'm on the advisory board for Salzbacher as one of the past chairmen. And I said to her, who are you giving this to? Who's seeing this? And she, she said, anybody who will listen. So <laughs> that's what you're all about today. We, we want you all to hear this. And I, I know we've gotten some really good questions in here. And let me just give you just a, a couple of them here um, that I'm looking at. And then Alex, maybe if you wanna combine a couple of these and, and do one or two. One of the, it's a real simple question is, how are the homeless gonna get to the new location? Okay. Um, when we showed uh, the different vehicles that we have, the shuttle bus that was up in the corner, which JTA provided, we're working with JTA and we're hoping to get more than one shuttle bus, but that shuttle bus will rotate through downtown all day long, which it does now, but it's going to come out to the new campus, come back downtown. So we will have our own private transportation to get okay. to our to our new facility. Yeah, I, I want to comment one one other thing. There are two things that are happening downtown that are incredibly important that are an overlay to this. As Salzbacher leaves downtown. You may know, many of you, that the Salvation Army has sold their property, which is all in the, Salzbacher and Salvation Army are in the Cathedral District. So this Cathedral District has been kind of like ground zero for homeless service providers. So when Salzbacher moves from downtown, 
and in the redevelopment of the almost almost three solid blocks of the cathedral district where the Salvation Army used to be, um, you will see an enormous change in the the uh, I would say the just this whole culture of the of the district. Um, just for those of you who want to know, the Salvation Army is consolidating all of their work down to their tower on the west side of downtown. So um, some of the problems that you see right now are going to be um, just by just by the relocation of the service providers are going to be uh, tremendously enhanced. Um, then one of the other questions that we had here was um, the 22 million, was that acquired in the 2022 Congress? I'm not sure it was 22 million. It was 2 it was, million. It was 2 million. 2 million, yeah. Yes. And it, it was last 2022. Year. Last, last year. year. Mm -hmm. Yep. Then there's a really good one in here from somebody who lives at the parks at the cathedral. Um, what percentage of homeless men are young, strong, healthy enough to be trained and to learn a new trade? Just thinking about the mentally ill who are not getting the care they need. You want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I would say when you're looking at the street homeless population, um, 30 to 40 percent, it's probably upwards to 40 percent now do have a mental illness. Um, more than that, have a co-occurring disorder. So they either have substance abuse or physical disability. So 30 to 40 percent. When we do our assessments at Soulsbacker, when people come to us, we basically look at income as two tracks. Either you're going to be able to get a job and we're going to be able to train you, or you're going to have to get disability. That's always been about a 70-30 split. 70% could work. We feel could work. We feel can be trained. 30% are too mentally ill or sick um, or elderly. Um, to be able to work. So I think that number, <clears throat> because the population is aging, we all know there's a silver tsunami and that also impacts the homeless population. But unfortunately, people that are homeless on the street, their chronological age does not match their physical age. People on the street age faster. And so um, we have about right now 180 people on the streets in Jacksonville that are 55 and older, 180. And that's a lot. If we, in the past, if we had five people in our shelter that were senior citizens, that was a lot, mainly because homeless people don't make it to that age. They die um, before they get to be 65. But right now, um, there's more and more um, elderly, not elderly, because I'm 55 and over. <laughs> I don't want to call that elderly. Seniors. I don't even want to call it that. Anyway, 55 and up, um, 180 is a huge number. And so, you know, um, that's something we need to be cognizant of and make sure that those folks are signed up for Medicare, Social Security, that we get them into the senior housing that they need. But in answer to the question, I would say 60 to 65% of the people we see are young enough and able-bodied enough to be trained uh, for jobs. Okay, another question was kind of um, specific to the river walk. Mm -hmm. And the question was, is there something that can be done to make appropriate bathroom facilities at the river walk? And I, I say it's specific to the river walk, but I've seen this problem all over downtown. I'm sure you have too, that there's a serious problem um, with people defecating and mm -hmm. urinating mm -hmm. downtown. Um, I've had, I receive complaints continuously from the business community on this topic. Yeah. So this is the age old problem. <clears throat> and the answer is the same that it always is. <laughs> so during COVID for a while, we had to shut down our campus, well, we had to limit the number of hours per day people could come on our campus because we were socially distancing and we were doing it in shifts. So there were a lot of hours when people weren't able to come on and use the bathrooms. And so we had to get Don's Johns. We need, we had to get Don's Johns. We used them throughout COVID right on the outside of our fence. We had a string of Don's Johns, like it's a concert. We had them out there. 
people use them, you pay people to come and clean them. Homeless population would use them if they were there. Um, but there has always been a lot of pushback about that. I mean, that's the answer. Uh, an obvious answer is that you need to put portable bathrooms up somehow. And even if it's a, a truck that has the portable units on it, like they have down at TPC, there are answers to that. But when we have suggested that in the past, uh, people downtown push back. Myself, I would rather someone going into a Don's John than defecating on the sidewalk. That's just me. Um, but you know, that's the answer. Okay, um, Alex, did you have any that you could combine that perhaps you you want to um, offer? Um, yes, I did have one that I'm hoping you'll be able to answer, and it's regarding homelessness versus affordable housing crisis um, causes and fixes. Um, we're seeing homelessness and affordable housing aren't necessarily the same issue and what your take on that is and and how you may or may not be the person to go to for that. Yes. So, and my friend, Steve Kelly could probably hop on here and tell you all about this, but affordable housing, it's a continuum. It's from workforce housing all the way to very affordable housing. So workforce housing, also is affordable housing, but that's for firefighters, police officers, uh, teachers. Those folks can't even afford to rent housing right now. They can't afford housing. And so when you hear the term workforce housing, I used it tonight because the housing I'm building at my new village um, is anticipated to be for people that work in that manufacturing plant. So workforce housing, I could, I could go on and on about this topic. I've had a couple of meetings with Amazon to say, because Amazon has a lot of their workforce, not a lot, they have a number of people working for them, and it's not a small number, that are homeless. And so they came to me like, oh, what can we do? You can build housing for the people that work for you. That's your responsibility. You should be building housing for the people that work for you. They're actually considering it. Um, you know, back in the 1900s, remember the railroad, they built housing for their workforce, workforce housing. So that's that whole end of the continuum, which Steve can talk a lot about. And then it goes down to my end of the continuum, which is very affordable housing or highly affordable housing. People that are on disability, they make $784 or something like that a month. They cannot afford really any more than 30% of that. So highly affordable housing is um, a lot of times that's, well, almost entirely has to be subsidized in some way, shape or form. And so when we're looking at how do you build that and how does my housing, perchance, marry with Steve's housing, the workforce housing, or even market rate housing. And that's called set-asides. And that's something um, in the affordable housing uh, quality of life task force. There was a lot of developers in there, for-profit, non-profit. And you know, one of the things we talked a lot about is set-asides for developers. Can you set aside 10 units within your 200 unit community where the people would pay less? Nobody would know it. You know, nobody knows who's in the subsidized units or where the subsidized units are. But that is a methodology that's used across the country. And you do have, like I said, experts on this call that could talk about it more depth than me. But affordable housing is a whole continuum of housing. It's not one. It's not monolithic. It's a continuum going all the way from people at middle income that can't afford housing all the way down to the folks I'm dealing with that are literally living on the street. So I don't know if that answered that, but hmm. that's, that so does. It sounds like we have another topic for another. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just uh, ask uh, uh, 
it's kind of an innocent question. We had a couple of questions of people who submitted before this, and we're going to only we're going to cut it off here in about another five minutes or so. Um, one of the questions was um, it, a two part, a two parter. Um, since you're moving out of the area, won't there be more people roaming? Uh, downtown, number one. And then number two, kind of linked with that was a question that came in early. It said, how can we best approach people who are on the street when they appear to be mentally ill? Is it safe? Should we approach them? Should we do anything? Uh, they're, you know, the good nature of most people are that they you want to help these people. A lot of times you just don't know whether it's safe or not. Okay. <clears throat> well, I will say this. I tell folks uh, to contact contact me. If you see somebody on the street and you think they need help, contact our HOPE team. Do not, I would not recommend engaging with somebody that you think is severely mentally ill, all right? They're not, um, they're not dangerous per se, um, but, um, you know, you don't know what kind of reaction you're going to get, first of all. And there are organizations already in place to help them. But I'm going to tell you something interesting that's new. So everybody knows there's a panhandling ordinance that went into, that got passed recently. And honestly, I'm not, against, <laughs> who's on the call? I'm not against that because I'm not a fan of panhandling. A lot of people that panhandle are not even homeless, okay? Gives homeless people a bad name. <laughs> Handing your dollar bill out the window doesn't help if the person was homeless, doesn't really help that person. It makes you feel good. It does not help that person. So we have a pilot going on. There's an organization called Meriton, and they just came to my board retreat yesterday and talked to my board, and we're piloting this program. It is like crowdfunding. So a homeless person gets a debit card and then a person like Steve Kelly can say, oh, I wanna be a Samaritan. So what Samaritans do when you sign up to volunteer for this is that you can, A, you can put money into a Samaritan account, you know, and what happens is these folks if they have a specific need, they can go through, there's a case manager involved, there always has to be a case manager involved, but if they need boots for a job or you know, they need money to help with a down payment of moving into, or something that's very specific and legitimate, you can actually fund that person. And more importantly, in my mind, you encourage them and it's all done through the phone. Homeless people have phones, okay? A lot of homeless people have phones. Thank you, President Obama, because homeless people need phones because you could never get a job in a million years if you don't have a phone. So a lot of homeless people do have phones and you encourage that person. You encourage that person through a phone. You send you know, messages of encouragement. And that is even more important to a homeless person who has nobody and people won't even look at them in the face. Um, so we are testing this and it's very successful around the country. And on average, the person gets maybe $60 a month, right? It's not a huge amount of money, but if there was a very specific bigger amount of money, the case manager you know, is the kind of screening. But instead of handing money out a car window, you actually know the person you're, you know who the money's going to, you know why it's going to that person, it's a person, you know who they are, and you can send messages of encouragement to that person. You're going to be hearing more about this because I plan to roll it out through the urban rest stop. And right now, we have 387 people in Jacksonville, Florida, that have already signed up to be Samaritan um, volunteers. So they're sending messages of encouragement and maybe only a quarter of them are giving money and that's okay. Baptist is funding it and we're looking at Florida Blue to fund it. But this gives people an opportunity one-on-one -on -one to interact with a person who needs your help without handing a dollar bill out the window 
because again, that's not really helping somebody in the long run. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a, a, a very interesting new pilot that's coming down the pike. Thanks. Um, I want to close this by saying how much we appreciate you, Cindy, and your staff particularly, and the work that you're doing in Jacksonville and being um, a leader in not only the state of Florida, but I think in the United States with how we handle this. And we all need to remember in so many ways how fortunate we are if you compare us to LA or New York. So we know we have a problem. I'm not trying to whitewash it. We know we have a problem, but I think with good advice from people like Cindy and her staff, particularly the outreach buses, we have a better handle on um, what can and cannot be done for this population. I wanna recommend two books to you. One is called uh, Toxic Charity. And the other one is the follow-up to that called Charity Detox which speaks to charitable or work and how often we get it backwards, like what Cindy calls handing the dollar at the window. It makes you feel good, but it doesn't help the other person. So uh, um, we're gonna close on that. I wanna thank you, Cindy, and thanks everybody. I mean, look at the number of people that came. I don't know what the total number is, but we had almost a hundred people sign up for this. So I know the topic is good. I know the topic is, um, a, really um, needed to be talked about in the community. And it, Cindy, will um, maybe you could um, give them your email address. How about that? So if you anybody wanted to talk to you directly or have a question um, that we didn't handle tonight, could you want to give them that? Okay, I'm going to chat it in, but it's my name, Cindy Von Kalser, C-I-N-D-Y-F-U-N-K-H-O-U-S-E-R, at Soulsbacker, S U L Z B A C H E R dot org. Great. And thank you, everybody, for joining thank us you. tonight. Thank you for listening to me blather on. I appreciate it. <laughs> All righty. Bye bye. Everybody. Thank you, everyone, for coming.